And welcome in. We are here with the Comenius Institute, Warp and Wolf Radio. Uh, Merry Christmas to those days. Yes. You know, week after Christmas. Dr. Mark, <laughs> how was right. your holiday, sir? Oh, it was lovely, lovely. I had a lot of t- fun with the kids and went out to Denver and gave a hug to mom from you. I and, want you and, know. and tell her I felt it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, man, uh, just to hope that everyone out here had a great holiday. And every Wednesday, uh, Dr. Mark Echo, Harold H.V. Bell, provide you with Warp and Wolf Radio, trying to put some sense between wisdom and knowledge and uh, as it pertains to specifically those young people leaving uh, away from home at the first time but not relegated to you old people out there who might need <laughs> to understand how to there you wisdom go. and knowledge in your own personal life. Uh, we got a great show today, man. Yeah, uh, this guest is be already good. in the house. Yeah. We're going to have a two-hour festival then. You know, I got in trouble Saturday. I don't know if you listened oh, to the no, show. No, I didn't. I did not know you were doing a show this week on, you know, the Christmas story and the okay. mythology of and my beautiful queen and I were on the air, and she yeah. takes Christmas to another level. Okay, okay. I keep Christmas kind of like, you know, here in the real. <laughs> so uh, it was quite entertaining to listen to the dialogue between oh, no. the queen and I on Jumbo Love. And, you know, we did have some mimosos and things, so it was kind of interesting that show. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting here. Please introduce our guest today, uh, Mark, and, uh, yeah. what we can expect. Yeah, absolutely. So Dave Pappas is a friend of mine from uh, teaching, not only in uh, high school, because we're both high school teachers, but college professor. Uh, We taught together at Crossroads Bible College. Uh, Dave teaches at Heron High School here in the city, and uh, he teaches uh, things like literature and ancient literature. Dave, thanks for being with us today. I'm grateful you're here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And we're going to talk. I've got some things to say to Dave off air because I've got one of my little protégés to go to Harry and she's uh, oh a yeah? whippersnapper, little Ariana <laughs> Martin. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. We got she's, what, she's what She is a, one of my mentees. She is a mentee of mine. I've been um, uh, doing work with her over the last year and a half, uh, kind of helping to propel uh, the gift that she has in stage and theater. Yeah. And uh, she actually hosts a radio show at the, uh, Avondale Meadows YMCA. Really? That we do. It's on. So she is the co-host. She is spectacular. Oh, that's love she that is girl. a whippersnapper. <laughs> yes, she is. So we're going to come right back. We're going to play mm. a little music. And then Dr. Mark and I and Dave are going to get into uh, the Christmas story. Yeah, <laughs> this should it. be interesting. You're listening to Warp and Wolf Radio on the Cool Groove site at Radio Next. Radio Next.TV, we are live on Warp and Wolf Radio, the Minius Institute sponsored show where we read wisdom and knowledge, putting them together, mm-hmm. hoping that it makes some sense out there of your you life. Go. Dr. Mark Echo, Harold H.B. Bell, and today we are joined in studio by Mr. Dave Pappas, a uh, teacher over at Heron High School, and we'll be talking today about Christmas. The story and the mythology. And as I mentioned before, I was on a show last week, this crazy show called The Jumbo Love Show, and I exposed myself probably a bit more than I should (laughs) about the Christmas story and, you know, how we got to this, so to speak. So, Dr. Mark, you know, as we do, the first hour, we pretty much... Uh, lay down where wisdom and life connect. Yep. And, uh, you know, that is the Comenius tagline. One more time, if you could, let's, yeah. let's give that exposure to Comenius. Yeah, absolutely. So Comenius is the bridge that we make between high school and college for young people going into IUPUI. And uh, what we know, of course, is that when Christian young people go into a public setting, the idea is that uh, their faith is challenged, and we're there to help that challenge answer some of those questions that they have every single week. Well, I guess this is a perfect segue to introduce this great book that's out right now that we're promoting, Science Fiction and the Abolition of Man. Um, And, you know, what I find intriguing every week, Mark, is as a ordained minister, uh, a man bringing (laughs) proverbs to light, hoping wisdom and and, uh, knowledge connect, that you're a big buff of science fiction and, you know, Greek mythology and all that. Uh, Tell me a little bit about science fiction and the abolition of man, uh, which is, I guess... uh, Written and edited by, who is this, you? Yeah, well, there's a chapter in there, and chapter two is actually by me. Uh, The title of the chapter is Monster in the Mirror. The problem with technology is the problem with us. So we really are the problem with ourselves. Well, we talk about this every single week. Yes, we do. (laughs) And, and, you know, first of all, we we need to address technology as it really stands, and technology is the science of the tools Mm -hmm. uh, that we can use of the day. Um, Like the radio back in the early 30s was the technology of the day. Um, So it's still technology. It's just not updated. And 
And so what we do every week is try through this new technological tool, Breed Awareness. So a um, little bit about your chapter in the book, sir. Yeah, a little bit about the chapter. You've really summarized it well when you talk about the issue of science and technology. The problem isn't with the science. The problem is the problem with us and our human nature and that we twist everything. And ultimately, our desire is to be God. We can't be God. We want to usurp and control everything. That was one of the great things that uh, C.S. Lewis talked about in The Abolition of Man. It's a tremendous book on, the, on educational philosophy. And so what we did as authors, there are about 30 of us in this book that wrote about the issue of how does science fiction film connect with this great educational process called The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis. So actually, we're going to be talking about a little bit about C.S. Lewis today. Well, and uh, I guess now, without any further ado, we need to introduce our great yeah. guest in the studio, uh, Dave Pappas, teacher over here in high school. Please introduce yourself and welcome aboard Radio Next TV and Warp and Wolf Radio. Well, thanks, HP. Um, well, I'm um, originally from Detroit, Michigan, and I, w- I did my education at Wayne State University there, and I was a public school teacher for a, a hot minute for uh, <laughs> a couple of years there in uh, in Detroit, and I eventually went to uh, Anderson University to pursue a seminary degree and um, I was in the ministry for about 15 years and um, then about I don't know about eight or nine years ago I um, transitioned back into the classroom and I've been teaching at Heron High School since uh, 2009. Uh, I teach seniors uh, 12th grade English and I teach a class uh, now called Critical Inquiry where we uh, explore all kinds of uh, you know deep issues. We've been talking about race this um, the first semester. We talked a lot about race and what race is and what it's not and how it how our percep- perceptions of race contribute to racism and prejudice and discrimination. And, Speaking of myths, and so yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And I so mean, I'm, people don't understand that gen, you know genealogy doesn't have anything to do. You know, right, mm-hmm. right. You couldn't discern me from you if you tried to. Right, to the right. If we look at the genetics, right, you're right. So There's it's been uh, it's good stuff. And uh, I have a, a wife. We've been married almost 25 years, Julie, and uh, we've got two boys. Uh, a son who's a sophomore in, at Albion College, and a son who's a sophomore at at Heron High School. Mm. Awesome, so, yeah. awesome. Well, welcome aboard. Thanks. Uh, today, Captain, is your kind of show, man. <laughs> I guess you picked this for the last show of the year on purpose. I yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah. Um, for those who have been listening, understands that uh, Dr. Eckel is a, a claimed author, but not only that, he does his teaching using uh, uh, horror films and, and <laughs> mythology, ancient mythology, as part of his lesson plan. That's right. Uh, so let's get right to it, partner. Uh, what right. is the importance of ancient literature, and uh, why do we still study the books like Iliad and uh, the Odyssey? Hmm. That's a that's a fascinating question, of course, and and it's one of those that really kind of jumps right into the middle of this thing. And you and I, Dave, have uh, been dealing with the, these kinds of books not only in our own teaching but in our own classrooms. So why don't you uh, attack this first? What is the importance of ancient literature, and why do we still study these books anyway? Well, I think ancient literature is just a window into uh, the minds and the the hearts of the ancient people. Mm. And so I, I, I don't necessarily make a huge distinction between ancient literature and modern literature, and I make a distinction in terms of its its age, mm-hmm. but um, I think literature is about um, is a, essentially a um, mythology. It's essentially you know explaining what people uh, think, what they value, what their um, how they react to certain situations, what they believe in, and uh, so ancient literature shows us what people believed and felt and dreamed about and uh, valued in in their time and um, and then it helps us to understand our time if we look back at the Iliad and we or the Odyssey and for example and we uh, explore how uh, Homer uh, perceived the heroes or the heroic acts or um, the religion of the day or, or whatever then we um, we can kind of uh, have a sense of what uh, compare it to how we think now. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, this is this really seems to be the the key. I think is is that human nature really hasn't changed much, has it? Right. That's yeah. The so, yeah. So when we talk about story and we talk about myth, or even when we're talking about Christmas that we just celebrated, uh, we're talking about ourselves as human beings. And different people in different times have communicated in different ways about these these kinds of ideas. You have any thoughts on that, man? Uh, first of all, I think to the listener, we need to you know dissect mythology. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times people read different books and different types of writings, but they don't know what era or where that comes from. So first, you know, Professor, um, <laughs> if you could kind of define mythology and what that means for the listener right now. Sure. Well, let's uh, let's do that. And, and Dave, since you're our guest for these two hours, I'm going to uh, bow to you, uh, you know, to, to introduce each, each of these ideas. How would you in your classes define mythology for your students? Well, I think the word mythology, like H.P. said, is... Um, it's fraught with peril because many times people hear it and they think <clears throat> mythology means um, it merely means fiction or it means some ancient story. Um, many times people think that mythology um, is like fairy tale or fable. And um, the word myth really just is the way I see it and the way I help my students explain. Or try to tell my students to define it is that uh, a myth is just a story that explains how something came to be. And so uh, that's why I don't make a big distinction between ancient literature and modern literature in the sense that it's all mythology. It's all explaining how people think and how, how we got to where we, we are. But it is important at some juncture to kind of tease out those those terms because some people do indeed have problems with that term sure yeah so how how would you talk about the christmas story as a myth let's talk about that for a moment hmm. well i think that the christmas story is the myth the explanation for how uh, god came to uh, the earth how he you know incarnated and um, started that that part of the uh, of the kingdom story I guess mm -hmm. is the way to the way to say it and so it's it's that explanation and we can see well that I'll stop there sure and from a Christian point of view of course the idea of Christmas is not a fairy tale by any means we believe that this is a space-time event mm -hmm. that this is a historic happening that uh, Christ came in real form as a real person in space and time and lived, died on the cross physically, rose again historically from the grave. So all of those kinds of things from a Christian vantage point, when we're talking about myth, we're talking about something that actually did happen, but it is our explanation sure. of how that thing happened. That's kind of what I was getting ready to add. It sounds like myth is a combination of uh, there, there's some truth that resonates inside the story that's told, but who the authors are and what they took away from it. Almost like when I talk about religion, and Mark, you know, you've heard me say this many times, uh, if there were 12 disciples and he told them to go, mm -hmm. you know, grab your stuff up and just go tell this, you know, this wondrous works of this, this Savior. Um, all 12, if we left the room today, we might see the same thing, but I think we would tell it a little different. So now it becomes myth. Uh, is is that close to it? Because fiction is just flat-out fiction. I think a myth would be something that is more collective than just my own perspective or somebody else's perspective. Yeah. I think so. I think the Christmas myth is kind of an, the traditional Christian understanding of Jesus, his birth, and what that that birth meant. So I think if I think it's more than just somebody's perspective. Um, I think it's a little bit broader than that. Mm -hmm. Now I can have a. I mean, I think we can have personal myth. <clears throat> excuse me. That uh, you know my personal story about how I became the person that I am is rooted in my own personal history. So if I'm telling a story, if I'm telling the story of my life, then I'm telling the story of being the grandson of Greek immigrants, of being from 
Detroit, Michigan, of being, you know, part of a family where my father was a professor, you know, etc. Whatever the, the different pieces of my story are, that would be my personal myth, my personal origin story. But if we're talking about something that's more widespread or more, um, I don't know, connected to other people, more communal, then I think there's there's some sort of agreement in that. There's a universa- universal universality. element yeah, yeah. to this kind of concept. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. interesting. Um, one of my, I'm bouncing around here uh, because I'm excited. Actually. Yes, go ahead. I mean, because really, I, this is this is so important because I think a lot of times as Christians first and then as people, we kind of base who we are, how we live off of the myths that are instilled in us. Sure. Mm. And so, you know, if we can get to, to discovering, hey, we're not that much different, then we can be more alike, I think so. Mm. Uh, but, Mark, you always mention origin. Yeah. Talk about the origin yeah. and and how we went from Christ coming here, giving the, the, the Christ child yes. through the virgin to the modern day. Right. So when we're talking about the origin of something, we're talking about the source of it. So the question is, where did this thing come from? And ultimately, when we're talking about a Christian view of life and things, a Hebraic Christian view uh, which means that there's a, a Bible that has given us information and knowledge and revelation from God. This author, you mentioned the authorship a moment ago, which is absolutely true and absolutely essential. So the question of origins is, where did this thing come from? And if it's simply a man-made issue, then, you know, it can be just like everybody else's origin story. But if there's something that is truly distinctive about this, that's supernatural, that comes from outside of Earth, that is heaven has a heavenly origin to it then perhaps there's something else that we should pay attention to and so when we talk about origins from a christian point of view we're saying we're talking about how did all things begin and who started everything and go back to your your uh, good word there authorship a moment ago uh, who was the author of all of this and then the question becomes okay now that i know where this came from and who the author is now do i bear any responsibility to this person what about you, Dave, on this issue of origins? Your thoughts on that? Well, um, I think the way you perceive your origins or the whatever the origins that we're talking about are, it impacts your, your actions. And so, um, again, if I go back to my own life, um, the way I understand my origins affects how I interact with people, how I see myself in the world. Um, when I encounter students who have no concept or no real understanding of their origins, mm-hmm. they don't know their parents, they don't know, uh, or they don't know their grandparents, or they don't uh, have a sense of their history, like how they got to uh, this country, they lack something that, that I possess. So it, that knowledge or, or lack of knowledge of their origins affects their, mm-hmm. their, uh, the way they act in the world. So as Christians, I guess the perspective that we have on the origins of our, of our religion um, affects how we um, live that religion out. So if we, if we don't believe... Uh, in the historicity of Jesus' birth, then that's going to affect how we how we live out our, our faith. Yeah, big so. time. And, and since you do a lot of teaching, Mark, around uh, mythology, Loch Ness Monster is a myth. Mm. How, how do we determine the differences between the Loch Ness Monster and its myth versus the Christ child and its myth. What what makes those two different in, the, in, in our processing sure. and belief yeah. of? Uh, yeah. That wasn't on the page. But. No, that's okay, man. That's all right. <laughs> well, let me give you, I, I think I'm up to 169 mantras now in my classroom teaching. I'm sure you have a whole bunch that you say yeah. over and over and over again, right? Sure. <laughs> I, I tease people and I just tell them, well, I'm, I have 169 now, I think. Anyway, one of my many mantras is, if you question a document's historicity, you begin to question its authenticity and ultimately its authority. Uh, 
So the question between the Loch, Ma Les Loch Ness Monster and Jesus, for instance, is you have to ask yourself, well, is there some kind of substantive documentation from people who have seen, heard, felt, been with, dealt with, uh, written, about. written about, all those things? And then, once you have that documentation, then you have to ask yourself, is it authentic? That is, is it verifiable? Can I go back and look at it and say, yeah, uh, judging from all the different tests that we have to know whether something is true or not, uh, yeah, I can, I can see where this thing is, is truthful. And this is something that we base, uh, b by the way, our ju jurisprudence on. We say things like, uh, not beyond a shadow of a doubt, uh, but beyond uh, the question of a doubt. That is, you can st there can still be some doubt invested here, but nonetheless, you bear the responsibility of saying, yeah, I, I have this information and this truth and this knowledge that's been given to me in this criminal case, and I can say, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, I can say, yes, this is true, and I can go back and verify that. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'd go, I mean, I think it has to do also with what the purpose is or the, I guess, the purpose of the, of the myth. And so uh, I think there can be, there is truth in, embedded in literature, in films, in poetry and music there's there's truth embedded in those things so uh, I don't think that it doesn't mean that we can't see something that's that has truth in it but if we're basing our lives on something then I think that's where the historicity I guess that's what I'm responding to is mm -hmm. so um, a story can be fictional but can also express a kind of mythology a kind of understanding of how we are to live um, and so I think that's that's why when you read a book or you listen to a song and you are moved to tears perhaps because of how beautiful something is or you look at an, a, an art piece um, you're moved because there's something true in that yeah. but you don't base your life on that song or on that art piece you so I think that's the difference between sure. what we do with with our faith and what we do with just you know art and literature in general yeah. now that's incredible because there are a lot of people um who hedge their lives on uh materialistic things on, on yeah. uh, myths that don't have any variance uh as we mentioned uh, we say it all the time mark you can't go wrong living by the rules of proverb whether mm -hmm. you're a it's bible true. believer whether you and it doesn't make a difference it's true. if you adhere to the rules of proverb then life will be a little bit less confusing mm -hmm. regardless so I that's think right that's what breaks the difference between we're going to take a short break here when we come back we're going to get into this christmas story and find <laughs> out how it all came to be one of the myths that we're going to be discussing i would like to tell you uh dave pappas that one of your students miss ariana martin just texted me and said she loves you and <laughs> said you were one of her favorite teachers and uh thought we would pass that along as that's well nice to hear we'll come back dave pappas mark echo Harold hb bell warp and wolf radio on the cool groove site Radio Next TV, and we are back warping Wolf Radio. Boy, this is this is getting a bit good and a lot of intellectual love, but you know we're having a great time with our host today, Dr. Mark Eckel, the co-host Harold Bell, and our special guest in studio, Dave Pappas of Heron High School, and we are talking about. Um, since Christmas season is here, we're talking about uh, the story and mythology of Christmas, how it came to be. Uh, the difference between mythology and fiction, I think, um, if I w would dare say with these two uh, educators, uh, <laughs> fiction is something that you can just imagine up, breed it, create it, and people buy it. Mm. Uh, mythology has an origin and a root where the populace said this was true. Um, now, the stories that come out of it might be different in, in their own view and their own slant and their own tint, but the origin. The consensus say this happened. Mm. Am I good in saying that? I think so. I think the idea is like if you boiled it down, if you take a, if you could take a story, any story, any narrative, and boil it down, and what you have left in the pan would be the myth. 
Well, let me, let me ask this then. You know, I'm, he, I'm excited. He, look at you go. <laughs> Why do religions have so much trouble then getting along? Um, because the origins, it seems, of most religions have some type of some truth that formed the myth. Um, for instance, I'm friends with a, mu- a Muslim brother, Michael Sy here. And one of the best guys I know. I believe in my Christian faith. He believes in his Muslim faith. But somewhere along that Muslim faith, there was an origin uh, from Muhammad <laughs> uh, to, to, sure. to build that religion that way. How do, we, how do we embrace without knocking other people's belief in their origin if there was some, some resonance of truth to the origin? Hmm. I think... I don't think there's any reason to knock somebody else's uh, understanding. Um, like we were talking about just before we came back on the air, that you you kind of live what you know. And so if that's what somebody knows from their upbringing, I think that we have to start where they're at. Um, I think the challenge with it is that it's it's not just a nice story or a nice perspective it's it's the import that we place on on the on the story so i think the reason religions have such a hard time getting along is because certain religions we should say have a hard time getting along yeah and i think it's because we place so much importance on on what we believe mm-hmm. and so um and I think so, and probably it's because uh, people don't have most people have a very limited understanding of other re- world religions, and so it's easy to watch the news or read a a headline on social media and assume that that you know things about what it means to be Muslim or Christian or Jewish or whatever. Um, and then we react to that. I was getting ready to say just a whole bunch of Christians don't know a lot about their own religion. Oh, my That's word. True. Isn't that and, the and truth? And that is dangerous as well when mm-hmm. we start trying to judge another religion and you don't even know where yours, uh, mm-hmm. the origin of your, oh, <laughs> yours that's is or started. There is so much to be said about all of that by itself. But let me come back and, and tag on to the good words that Dave just mentioned here. Uh, you know, frankly, there is no sense, no need, no uh, no reason to knock anybody's belief system. My word, I had young atheists come into my classroom when I was teaching in Christian contexts, and they would tell me straight up, face to face, they'd say, you know, I'm an atheist. And I would, I would shake their hand, and I'd say, that's all right. That's good. I'm glad you're here. Let's talk. We'll have this discussion. Now, so you, you treat everybody like Jesus taught us to treat everybody with love. But when people ask me about this uh, Christian thing and, and they say to me, well, why do you think your Christian view is, is better? And I'll say, no, I don't think it's better. I think it's different. And it's different because of what Jesus said. Jesus was the one who said this, not me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father except through me. Now, we can have a discussion about that, and whether you agree with it or not, that's not the issue really. But you got to deal with what Jesus said. There it is. So don't take issue with what I'm telling you, because I'm going to love you no matter what. Here's what Jesus said. That's what's uh, his word on the topic. Now we have we start there from the, with that discussion. Could, could I ask this question, Dave? Uh, so I'm jumping around here. Uh, your your students and you teach basically senior high school students. Um, their development and understanding, I guess, at this time in life, is right there where you you know able to decipher the difference between myth, fiction, personal beliefs. How, what, what's your, what's your, your, your student population? Uh, where do they resonate around those subject matters? Hmm. Well, I teach at a public school, so we don't, you know, we're not talking about, you know, religion. Specifics, or Specific yeah. of what, you know, what's true or what's not true. We... If I understand your question, they, the mo- the majority of my students seem to um, have trouble believing in kind of one way of, of doing anything. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, sense of like, well, um, 
I, I don't want to call it. Re- I guess it's relativism, but it's not. That's that's too much of a. That's too much of a negative term. So I mean, my stu- if I'm understanding your question, my, my students come at uh, at life from so many different perspectives. You know, uh, racially, economically, um, f- uh, socially, like you know their family backgrounds, and so it's. There's no, there's so many, uh, there's so much diversity there that it's hard to um, to come up with a consensus. Does that make? Is that, that that's exactly where I was going because I know um, at 58 years old when we grew up, man, it was one way or two ways of thinking, and that was the you know right. you weren't on that mm-hmm. highway, you were considered something's wrong. Yeah. Um, and today, I, I truly believe the tools of technology of today have allowed students to. Uh, by the time they're 16, 17, and 18, man, the, the viewpoints must be so broad and varied. Uh, they're broad try. and they're cynical. That's the thing. I think that's the overarching um, So they believe in nothing. Or, or they they believe, but they believe just to a point, and then they kind of say, like, uh, they, they just, I guess there's not a lot of hope necessarily in whatever they believe. So... I mean, there's a, certainly a sense of empowerment and a sense of, um, you know, I think my students, because they're 17 and 18 years old, most of them, you know, they do have a sense of of strength and confidence and, you know, we have a voice and we've got to do something in our world and, you know, they're, they're, there's that kind of perspective. But in terms of what fuels that, um, that's very diverse. You know, I have a, it's kind of related a number of years ago I was as I would uh, be teaching vocabulary to my students there was a student who uh, I would often say like well what a great word you should go home and use that word tonight when you're having dinner and I would say that it was just kind of a a joke or a, a line that I would say and I had a student who at one point in the semester he said Mr. Pappas do you think he kind of laughed he said do you think we all go home and have dinner with our families the way that you do, and I, it, it, it was so, so such a small statement, but it really uh, serves as a reminder to me, and that my kids, my students, come from so many different perspectives, and it just remind you know I, I said yeah I guess I did I mean in my perspective I did think that at least at some point my students would have a way of s- sitting with people that they love and eat a meal together but then when I thought about it I thought well of course they don't because there's all different kinds of family backgrounds and Mm -hmm. so um, so that kind of just goes to that perspective thing and that kind of takes me back to you long way around this track Dr. Mark (laughs) since we're talking about Christmas and the Mm -hmm. myth of and Dave has just candidly spoke about the origins and, Mm -hmm. and the origin of Christmas has to be the same way, then, as the origin of education, the origin of family, the origin of anything that we do. Where you come from is how it's going to relate in your life. How do the origins of the different people that we uh, encounter every day uh, have their the thinking of Christmas brought about? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, since we're getting back to that. Yeah. We? Well, that's an important question. So the question is, why is it that when we live in a culture as we do, that celebrates this holiday. Now, some people don't want to call it Christmas because they view that as as a loaded term. But nonetheless, people are giving gifts to each other because there was some event in history of some person who came as a real person in space and time. His name was Jesus. And people are celebrating that. No matter whether they believe it or not, there's an origin for that particular practice just as much And here's one for you. Just as much as young people go to Miami Beach for spring break because Jesus rose from the dead. Now, why is it that we have these kinds of celebrations? They had to come from someplace. Now, whether or not you accept them as truth or you accept them as fact, that's really not the issue, whether you accept it or I accept it. Whether or not it's true has a whole different ramification, and how we come to that truth is something that we've already expressed about history and and documentation and veracity and so on. But we all come back to the Christmas story because 
there's something about it that attracts us and draws us. Even if it's just giving of gifts. Why do I give gifts to, to people who maybe I don't even like? <laughs> but I'm giving them a gift. Don't give me stuff. <laughs> why, why do I feel compelled to give somebody a gift? Now, of course, we give gifts to people that we love and cherish, obviously. But there are times when we're given to people. I remember giving to my students. You know, I'd have them into my home. And we'd have parties and stuff. Do you think these students deserve my food? No, they didn't deserve my food. But it's a gift. That's, and the Christian concept behind that, of course, is grace. Oh, we give something that's undeserved. Wow. And this whole Christian concept then, of course, is mushrooming into people's lives. Whether they accept it or believe it or not isn't the issue. It has an origin. Coming back to your question, HB, I think there it is. That's the reason why people celebrate it, because there's, there's something connected to history there. I think there's also something about, um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead of what you wanted to ah, talk right. about a little bit, but, um, you know, who you identify with. I think the, the power of the Christmas season or story is that there's a lot to it. And so, you know, if you say, like, what is Christmas? Well, Christmas is a lot of things, right? It's it's the Christmas story. It's the birth of Jesus that we celebrate. It's also commercialism and gift giving and, you know, whatever. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we can associate with Christmas. And uh, to me, you know, we identify Christmas. I'm sorry. So much of Christmas is commercial. And, and yes, it's, absolutely. you know, after we open the gifts on Christmas Day and, Everybody left our home after dinner. You know, I said to my wife, it, so that's over. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's, you know, now I'm going to look at the tree for the next couple of weeks and wonder when are we going to take down the tree and get back to normal. And so, um. but I think the power of Christmas is also, power of Christmas is also, power of Christmas is, also the power of christmas is 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 in which part of the story that we identify with and so you know the story of christmas is not just a little baby in a wood crate you know in a manger or whatever it's it's certainly that, but it's also got the refugees. You know, we I mean, there, there's such a connection to what's going on now with people moving from one place to another place and having no room for them. Mm -hmm. um, my wife and I just watched this gut wrenching and heart breaking um, doc frontline documentary last night on PBS. Did you Jesus watch that? Christ. It was mm -hmm. so. Um, it was about the uh, the refugee crisis, and not just not just from Syria, but Syria, Gambia, and one other uh, country, I believe. Anyway, and it just followed just what how difficult it is to be a refugee, and we and um, and that sounds so silly to even say. Like, of course, it's difficult, but um, to watch that and then to think in our Christian origins origin story of of jesus's birth there is the refugee mm -hmm. and you know in terms of how do i live out my faith how does that story that myth impact how i live well if it's just about god impregnating a teenage girl and for the hope you know for the hope of the world someday i mean that's sounds a little harsh to say it that way but if that's all it is then that's great so you're not buying but, that <laughs> but it's not i mean it's not just about that it's because then if i forget i it's not just about that it's 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 about that but it's also we i that origin story i can also say oh it's about loving the stranger and it's about um the courage of being called on to do something extraordinary, like Mary was called on to carry 
um, Jesus and, and give birth and how courageous that was and how courageous it was of Joseph to oh God. To, to deal with that and, and to not divorce her and not to uh, abandon her and how uh, how difficult it was for them to to move from one place to another place while she's pregnant in order for the census to take place. And if I forget all that stuff, then I'm forgetting a central part of the of the story. Mm. We and started – I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, we uh, talked – actually started our last week's program with that. And it was one of my first lines in the in the program when I said, if you've got a problem with immigration, you've got a problem with Jesus. Sure. Because Jesus was an immigrant to yeah. Egypt. So, I mean, this is really powerful, important ideas here. It is. And then, you know, the – the beautiful. See, I think so many times we talk about Christmas, and sure, it's it's mythology. It's a, an explanation of how our, you know, religion or how our the fa- the um, the focus of our religion began. But we tell it like it's a like it's just a fable or a fairy tale. And we might believe, you know, I think Christians obviously we believe the story, but we tell it like it's. Um, I don't know. It's just it's boring, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. So, you know, there's like five shepherds in a field, and then angels appear, and it's beautiful, and everybody's you know having a wonderful time, and they go almost you know we we tell it like they almost go in a trance to this manger scene where there's uh, everybody is gathered nicely for a family picture with the pigs and the cows and the mm-hmm goats or whatever and uh and then how nice that the the three kings come and they're all giving gifts and we just it's it's so put together so nicely and we forget that it's or no we don't forget we just don't even realize that it that the story wasn't like that it part was of, messy yeah part of yeah exactly <laughs> messy that's exactly right this is a very uh difficult story that we're talking about here not just in terms of its heavenly origins that God turned the world upside down by introducing this brand new event, this brand new person. I talk about power and weakness. My word, it's, it's embodied in Jesus. Uh, but beyond this, you know, the sadness of our teaching in churches today, how we don't, uh, we don't tell the story from different vantage points, mm-hmm. from uh, different perspectives of people that lived it, that were involved or invested in it. You know, how about Anna and Simeon, for instance? Here are two older people, octogenarians. You know, here they were. They're waiting for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And finally he comes. And what about preaching them? Mm -hmm. You know, what about them? And the shepherds, my word, they were the the lowest of the low in the ancient culture. And And they're the ones that are the first to receive the information. And women, oh my word, women. How do you not... uh, if you have, have any clue about ancient literature, specifically from a Hebraic Christian point of view, women's point of view in those cultures were not esteemed. And so when you have these women who were invested in this, when you see five women in Jesus' genealogy, mm-hmm. man, you know, I'm, and I'm looking at Dave over here with these, my eyes are about as big as I can make them be, you know, but five women in this genealogy this is unheard of can you imagine what the rabbis must have done when they saw this thing come out you know boy talk about reality tv this is like a smack in the solar plexus so that's the or i mean so the story that you tell is the story that you i guess you live and so if you don't tell the story of if you don't use that language of like refugee you know, that's powerful language. It wasn't just that Jesus and it wasn't just that Mary and Joseph decided to hop on their, you know, their good donkey and <laughs> and walk, Roll you know, and, the and, you know, and, like I'm just going to go. It's the holiday season. That's what we do. Right. So my family, you know, I go to Detroit or Chicago or whatever for the holidays. That's not what they were doing. Yeah. They were they were going across, you know. I, I don't even know what it would have been like, but I mean, it was a, a tough journey, and she was pregnant, and they were poor, and you know, blah blah blah. And so, if we don't tell that part of the story, then we just see it as 
they were going somewhere for the holidays. Yeah, exactly. Well, well I know, man, we've been all over the place. We're <laughs> going to take a short break here. Uh, but when we come back, we want to talk about, as we lead into the next hour, Mark, about uh, story and myth shaping our life. And then we're going to go into the, the Christmas story in depth uh, about, you know, Jesus being a hero and yeah. uh, where everything fits in perspective um, to the mythology of I don't like to say mythology of Christianity, but that's what we're discussing today on Warp and Wolf Radio. <laughs> Dave Pappas, uh, the teacher over at Heron High School, Mr. Mark, Dr. Mark Echo, and me, your lowly servant. Here <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back on Warp and Wolf Radio. <laughs> Radio Next TV on the Cool Group site as we come by and try to capture our stuff from the break. And uh, having just a very interesting discussion today mm -hmm. about Christmas and mythology. Um, and it's ironic that um, across the Radio Next TV platform, we have different shows addressing different things. And last Saturday on my show, I put a little bit more uh, candor and humor into the Christmas story without it being uh, <laughs> educational. <laughs> Let's put it like that. It, it was, it was, some was funny, some was a bit brutal and harsh. So. We do not want to offend anyone out here today that's listening to this or take wrong uh, some of the things that we're saying about Christmas because we truly believe that the Christ child was sitting here in the likeness of God so we could redeem ourselves later on in life. But there are surrounding uh, and peripheral uh, things that go along with this story that we, we choose not to discuss. So mm -hmm. we're just trying to open a candid conversation, critical thinking conversation about some of those things. So, so that's our disclaimer. There you go. Now you don't have to get in trouble after Okay, the show. there you go. Ma, <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> but uh, we were talking before we went into the break. Um, and, 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 of course, a lot of mythology is centered around heroes. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. uh, how should we take uh, heroes in movies versus uh, heroes of today? And then I guess the real question is, do we consider Jesus a hero mm. based off of the, the story of Christ being born in the Bible? Yeah. That's for either one of these uh, Okay, well, I'm, I'll jump in and say uh, I, I believe that we have mirrors in every aspect of culture of, of the original truth. So the original truth, let's say, for instance, we've already talked about this, of Christmas, is a real person in space and time, his name was Jesus, was incarnate, that is, embodied in the person of a child impregnated within the body of a person named Mary uh, by the Holy Spirit. So we're talking about this origin story. We're going back to something we said in one of the first segments. This origin story now is the basis for all of everything else we're going to say about Christmas as Christians. But people are going to spin that thing in different directions. They're going to go in different ways with that story, intended or unintended, doesn't matter. So take the concept of hero. When you're looking at heroes, let's say, for instance, Roman or Greek or whoever your, your heroes were in ancient literature, we touched on this earlier as well, all of these heroes in some way or another bear marks of either a God-centered or a human-centered point of view. So, if, you know, my students and I, for instance, in World Lit this last semester, we dealt with Odysseus. Well, man, when you read a when you read the Odyssey and Odysseus, Odysseus was was not a good guy. I mean, he did all kinds of nasty stuff, and there were all kinds of negative things that were associated with this. But from a Greek point of view, this guy's a hero because he'd made this journey. It was ten years after this awful war. He finally got back home. He got reunited with his wife. There's all kinds of stuff going on there. So, you, but it's very much of a human-centered point of view. I believe that some of the heroes that we see in the movies, for instance, uh, come out of this spin. That is, we desperately are looking for a hero. That old song out of the 1980s, looking out for a hero. Uh, this great song is something that everybody looks for. We're looking for a hero because we know we can't save ourselves. And if we can't save ourselves, there's got to be somebody someplace else that's outside of us that's going to save us. So I view this, uh, coming back to my original comment, I view these heroes really as mirrors of the original intent of what God had uh, established in his son Jesus. Hmm. Uh, Dave, let me pose this a different way. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. Yeah. He knows when you've been panicked. <laughs> 
come on, man. How come Jesus isn't a hero like uh, the fictitious uh, God we've created in Santa Claus? In Santa Claus, sure. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think Santa Claus is uh, – he, br- he brings us things without uh, really asking much in return, right? I mean, I think that, you know, you got to be good, but – I mean, I don't think I've ever met a kid that didn't receive. I don't think I've ever met somebody who didn't receive something um, because you know their parents said, "Well, you were bad this year, so you're not getting anything." I mean, that's you know, stocking filled with cold. Right. I mean, that doesn't it doesn't really happen. Now, you know, people don't. I'm not saying that everybody gets uh, the same kind of gifts or whatever, but I mean, you know, the story of Santa Claus is really that he brings gifts to all children it's not about uh you got to live the right way and then he'll give you a gift um even though that's the that's the song um jesus i think you know see jesus christmas isn't about just about christmas it's about easter it's about the whole the whole thing so i don't think christmas translated is more christ well there you go i mean that's what Christmas means more Christ is what they're talking about. And I think um, when we start talking about more Christ, it's like how much Christ do you have in your life every day in the simple things when you walk into the store and hold the door for somebody. Uh, if you see somebody struggling and they need 52 cents at the <laughs> counter because they didn't have enough money and you give the 52 sure. cents. You know, I just, I just think more Christ in your life. The simple things add up to more Christ in your life. Um, and then those perpetuate themselves into being big things mm-hmm. um, because everybody's practicing that same type of harmony, that same type of language of love. And now we've got more Christ in our environment. Um, I, would, I would just jump in here and say that, that, that I would go back to the origin issue again and say, why is it that we do anything that's good for somebody else? And so there, there has to be this origin that says uh, because there is a reason, there is a good, there's a standard, there's a righteousness outside of us uh, to which we must give an account. Because if that standard isn't there, well, if the per- person doesn't have the 52 cents, who says I should give 52 cents? Who says really is the ultimate issue in all of life, the great question of all of life, who's my authority? So by what authority do we do that which is accepted in our human culture as good. Well, I do good things from a Christian vantage point. This goes to our tagline. Titus 3, do good, do good, well, do good. Well, I was going to throw it out you're, there. You're, like gonna, lob, you're jumping all over. I that right out there too, <laughs> you too, buddy. This is all based on the good God who has sent his good son, who has established good salvation for all people. If we don't have that origin, if we don't have that standard, then... Uh, we're really st- seriously in trouble, and who cares about the fifty-two cents? You know, at the end of the absolutely, day, absolutely, absolutely. But you know, that type of mindset and that type of um, uh, charity, and we talk about this all the time. You know, the three things you know God really, <laughs> really loves is you know, want charity being the most. Mm-hmm. That's right. Appreciative thing, you know, you can't do too much to please God, but mm-hmm. He really likes charity, mm-hmm. um, and so I think that we have to do that just innately from our heart. But it goes back to the origin of giving mm-hmm. uh, I gave me yep. in life itself so you could be better so we're going to just recap as we close this show down in the second hour um, you know we've been talking about uh, myths and how the stories shape our lives influence who we are the things that we do uh, myths could be I guess uh, parallel with culture uh, because all things we are and all things we know kind of come from what we know um, and then as you grow and develop you can you can make choices but uh, we wanted to find the words that uh, we use to explain our lives, why origins matter, and how the discussion of myth impacts Christmas. And we've been talking about it candidly, and we hope we don't offend anyone uh, about the Christmas holiday. I mean, we have all celebrated and, and are strong Christians mm-hmm. in this room. You can feel mm-hmm. it in the spirit mm-hmm. that we're having today. But we also have to be, uh, as we develop as a culture and develop as people, Start opening up dialogue that's important to everyone instead of things that you just think and want to hold on to. Uh, Dave Pappas is in the house, principal over at, I mean, not a principal, but a teacher <laughs> over at Heron. I'm sure your principal didn't want to hear that. <laughs> but a uh, teacher over at Heron High School. And uh, talk about Heron High School, Dave, for a moment. And some of these students, as I mentioned, I've had the pleasure of meeting more than one student uh, 
real, real affinity with one. Uh, but but talk about the students that enter Heron um, that it makes it a little bit different than your your public school system. Uh, well, student. Heron's a it's a charter school, which means it's a public school. But it um, charter schools simply um, need a reason to be. So a charter school, you know, gets its uh, the word charter is kind of its uh, its plan, its purpose, and so um, so that's you know what uh, people are drawn to our school for a number of uh, things. One is it's in the city, and so it's uh, right downtown on 16th and Pennsylvania, uh, in downtown Indianapolis. It's in a historic on a historic campus, the uh, his, the campus of the Heron School of Art and Design. The, the original campus and a lot of people get those confused very much and um, but we are Heron High School which happens to be on the campus the former campus of Heron School of Art and Design Heron School of Art and Design is on IUPUI's campus it's you know part of that university um, perhaps more importantly our, our school is um, the campus as far as the, the the most important thing about the campus itself is that it's on the site of the original John Heron uh, Art Institute, and uh, that's the you know that's what's significant about that corner at 16th and Pennsylvania. But um, part of the the reason for that school existing is to uh, bring together students of various backgrounds, and so you know we have a fairly diverse uh, racial um, makeup uh, as well as uh, socioeconomic uh, makeup, and. Um, the students come from all over the metropolitan area, so it's not just uh, it's not just Marion County. It's not, and it's it's the surrounding counties, and uh, that provides a pretty rich, um, you know, a more, rich environment. More, more to the tune of what America is like. I, I think so. I think so. And and our school is a, uh, it's our focus is a classical education. So we try to uh, to focus on uh, the on instructing students in such a way that builds their knowledge um, not just simply you know giving them information uh, and I'm not saying that in contrast to other schools I'm just saying that that's our we're, we try to be very um, deliberate about how we instruct the students so you know the tri the classical approach to education was you know grammar logic rhetoric they call it the trivium and so those three things you know you start with the grammar, the, the, the foundations, the fundamentals. You move to logic, which is kind of making connections um, between things, and then the rhetoric would be that you can, you can create something fresh, new, based on what, um, what you've learned. I and love so that. that's, um, that's the classical approach. And then also a part of that would be what is called Socratic dialogue, which is just, you know, Socrates. Um, made famous by you know Plato uh, in his Plato's dialogues, you know they were it was all about dialoguing, and so truth or knowledge wasn't uh, wasn't given; it was uh, explored, it was discovered, and so through questions, and so um, even though the so that's what we that's harder to do. I mean, you know, it's but it's that's the uh, the approach to kind of entrust the students with the ability to explore and, and discover uh, discover the knowledge. And I think that's relevant to what we've been talking about today because, you know, you've, you've, as you've been saying, we certainly don't mean to offend anyone, but there's nothing offensive in, in saying that the Christmas story is rich in, in truth. And that truth is certainly at one, at a very foundational place, it's about God becoming man, becoming a human, uh, in order to live uh, life among humans, and then to you know pay the the price uh, and rise again. I mean that's all that's the foundational truth. But there's so much more to the story than just that. It's the the implications of Jesus coming to Earth, uh, being born as a as a human. You know. Uh, the implications are why we have a Christian religion at all, you know, period. It's not just some story about um, a teenager giving birth to a 
you know, God, man, you know, it's, it's, so the implications are, are great, are, are huge. And, um, that's why we have, um, that's why we have Christianity. I mean, because it's survived for 2000 years based on a lot more than just a baby being born. It's the baby is why we, you know, we follow Jesus, but I don't know. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes sense. You're making I mean, too so, much sense. Okay, well. I, mean, all I, I mean, the critical thinking wheels are rolling in my brain, and all I could think was, imagine Mary and Joseph in today's society with an illegitimate baby, and we're going to tell you this is Christ in the flesh coming himself. Right. We would, we would, boy, <laughs> we would destroy whoever told the story and whoever came with it. Dr. Mark, we're moving into the, the main course mm-hmm. of this discussion, and each and every week you always... Uh, give us information and related uh, movies mm. <laughs> about how we should think about this uh, mythology and this Christmas story. So let her rip, man. I know we, you know, how, how does this story intersect with uh, some of the movies that, that you do your teachings from? Yeah. Well, let's start with maybe the most classic uh, Christmas story, which is uh, a Christmas story, the Christmas Carol, uh, Charles Dickens' famous uh, book. Which, by the way, just a little bit of background on Dickens and how he wrote that book. Um, Dickens was in, in real need of money when he wrote that book. And he wrote it to make some coin. I mean, straight up. So there it is. He, he wrote this little book not thinking that it was going to become this magnum opus, which it's become. I was telling people in my church, I was teaching on wisdom. And uh, the last session that I had with them was on justice, how justice comes out of wisdom. And I was telling them about how Robin, my wife, and I uh, kind of playfully uh, argue over which is the better story, you know, the better Christmas carol. I'm a big uh, George C. Scott kind of guy, you know, and she's an Alistair Sim kind of guy. But I'm going to tell you that, that that story is a microcosm of what comes out of the Christian uh, belief system. That is that here are people like Scrooge who have done people wrong. They have ripped people off. They have, be, they have been unjust, unloving, unhumble people. And because of that, they then have perpetrated basically this crime on humanity by not treating them properly, not treating them well. And this then, of course, is upended by the three spirits uh, that come to visit him and uh, throughout this one particular night and all of the things that go along with that particular story. But all of the elements of that story, the benevolence and the beneficence of good people along the way, that all comes out of this Christian origin that there was a real person in space and time who was this good, the standard of goodness that God had sent to this earth. Well, that story that Dickens wrote is based on this concept. And so this goes back to something you asked me early on. And that was, how do we see this thing uh, being uh, made up or talked about uh, by other people? How do they incorporate the Christian, Christian story in Christmas even if they don't believe in it? Well, they play, they play movies like this mm-hmm. because the movies bear elements of this truth that while it's not all truth, it nonetheless speaks to the essence of that truth. That is that there was this one who came and did offer this benevolent beneficence and was good and the reason why a Scrooge needs to get his act together and change his life and be transformed by this outside spiritual realm. Hmm. I could go on and on and on about this, but that's just a, one he, example. This is his, this is his, I tell you, that's why we're at the main course now. <laughs> you know, you're not even fork out. Uh, Dave and, and Mark, uh, one of has this question here. Um, uh, the culture of America has created a hero-centered type of environment where mm-hmm. everything that we do, every you know, right, there has to be a hero or an anti-hero um, in the Christmas story. And then you mentioned Scrooge. How, how is he relative to the anti-hero story? Well, you know, he becomes this person who is changed and transformed. And we see this kind of thing taking place in movies all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we see this not just in Christmas stories, but in all kinds of hero stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Dave, what do you think about this? What are some of the hero things that come to your mind when you think about this question? Well, I talking about Christmas, I can't it's hard to articulate this, but I, I think Jesus certainly f- 
follows this hero, in, in many ways, follows a hero's journey. But it's not just, see, Christmas is just about the baby being born. That's what we celebrate and the gifts that were given to him and, and all that. But the, the story of Jesus, the story of Christmas to me is, ta- is you don't, we don't celebrate the ba- just the baby. We celebrate what the baby, who the baby became and how he grew and how he learned and how he sat in the temple and listened to the, you know, teachers of the law and how he, um, be, you know, became Jesus Christ. And so, um, so that's the heroic story. And, you know, there's the, 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 you know, every hero in literature, the traditional hero uh, receives a call and has to wrestle with the call. Like, do I accept the call or do I not accept the call? Do I do it or do I not do it? And, you know, Jesus does, does that in the, in the wilderness, you know, the temptation where he has to wrestle with, do I, am I going to do this or am I not going to do this? And then he, he gets through that. And, um, you know, so, and, and the story of Jesus is a little bit non-traditional in terms of how he follows the, the journey. But he comes back to that even before he goes to the cross. And he has to say, you know, if there's any way, God, that I don't have to do this, <laughs> if there's any way this cup can pass for me, then I'm, I'm open and but your will not my will be done and that's the you know the power of that story and i think that's every hero's literature every hero in literature um, goes through some sort of wrestling like that and i think that's um, the power of of literature is that we see mm-hmm. the, a human that wrestles with that so i guess the difference between the traditional hero stories and Jesus is that we know that as we're list, as we're reading the stories of Jesus, any sort of up or down that he experiences is we know where it's ending. We know where the story is ending. Uh, we know that he is not going to succumb to his temptation. We know that he's not going to leave. We know that he's not going to cuss out his disciples because he's disappointed with them we know that he's going to that jesus is going to put everything on his back and he's going to go to the cross and he's going to rise again so um that i mean that's the story of of christmas and easter together Um, but for some reason i guess we're just drawn like to this notion of somebody coming to save us and so the stories throughout history are who's going to save us, who's going to save us, who's going to save us. And that, and that goes back to the anti-hero. Um, that's why we're so enamored with it. Um, yeah, I was just sitting up here thinking, and, you know, my crazy mind is, <laughs> I'm thinking, Joseph, that brother was, <laughs> brother's my hero. Because, I'm, I mean, you know, if you start telling the story and getting down to the critical thinking coming from a scene, you know, and you said the origins of where we come from are closely identified with, the heroes that we choose. And I just look at this guy and say, he was amazing. Mm. He was amazing. Mm-hmm. And so, so, you know, if it's a brother producer out there, y'all need to do a story on Joseph. On Joseph himself, <laughs> <and Joe>, huh? Because <laughs> that man was amazing to mm-hmm. be able to, to deal with the drama, the offset drama of uh, being the husband of uh, a wife who's impregnated and he wasn't the sure. biological father and dealing and sticking with that. Um, that That's hero stuff coming from my neighborhood. Yeah. Well, that's the... That's the uh, I think that's the point of what you know Mark and you are talking about today is that the story of Christmas is not I, I know this doesn't sound right when I say it but it's not just the story of Jesus it's the story of Jesus but it's also the story of how different people responded to Jesus and I think that's why perhaps the story Perhaps uh, Christianity and Christmas is so uh, unsatisfying for so many people who are not who are on the fringes of Christianity or not um, believers at all is because it just the way that it's presented so often seems so unreal and um, so when we identify and we say well yes Jesus came uh, God came but again going back to what we talked about at the opening you know 
how Mary responded to the news is part of the story. And how Joseph responded is part of the story. And so the heroes, you can find heroes within the story as well. The innkeeper. Jesus is the big <laughs> the, you know. Jesus is the big hero of our story of Christianity. Um, but I suppose you could argue that Joseph is a kind of hero in the story of Christmas. Mary is a kind of kind of hero mm-hmm. in the story of Christmas. Yeah. And you know when we watch movies, that's you know you mentioned the anti-hero. So I mean at some point in literary history we we get what we call an anti-hero or there's other literary terms like a Byronic hero and the notion of more real heroes in our the anti-hero is really not this kind of hero but the notion of when we watch movies now and we see somebody who's who wants to do the right thing but they're struggling with whether they're going to do the right thing or not and maybe along the way to making the right choice they make a number of bad choices um, but ultimately they 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 do the right thing. And it could be, I mean, that's what I tell my students that that's what most of our heroes are in our. That's what in, most in, of us are. That's what most of us are. Of right. Life. And so I think that's why we're drawn to the characters in many films. Um, you know, a couple that come to my mind just because I love his, uh, his films uh, of Denzel Washington. You know, Denzel Washington in the movie Flight is this kind of hero. He, he's full of all kinds of brokenness. He's an alcoholic and a drug addict, and, but he's an amazing pilot, and he saves people by doing the right thing, but people think he did the wrong thing, and, and eventually he has to pay for what he did, m- mistakes that he made, and, um, but he does it. He, he pays for it. He kind of steps up or mans up, as people say. Um, that's you know that was a powerful film when I watched it not because he was perfect but because he was so messed up and so broken but in the end Denzel Washington's character um, makes the right choice mm-hmm. and and it's in the very last scene when he's uh, in prison spoiler alert for, <laughs> but it's powerful and then there's another film that he just did with um, called The Magnificent Seven which is another example that, that movie is full of these kinds of heroes where there's all these messed up guys that are trying to save a, a town and they're doing it by killing people which is you know that's the <laughs> that's the problem with the, so many of these stories is that uh, our heroes are we 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 see her- heroism as vengeance and revenge uh, and that's a difference with the Jesus story is that it's not about revenge it's about um, you know taking the heat for, uh, for what's wrong, uh, but the power of the those movies is that we see people like you said, HB, like that are like us. They're broken like we are, and they're trying to do the right thing. Yeah. And I think what Mark brings up often is that, or always, is that why we know as we're watching those films that if you're thinking, if you're a thinking person, you know that. The brokenness doesn't end, you know. Like you, the heroes in those movies might solve the problem in the movie, but we know that there's another problem just on the other side. And and, and that leads me as we we start to cruise and land this big plane today, yep. Mark. Yep. Um, coming back to why we study literature at all, and then what is the importance of the church mm. as we study literature? Mm. Well, first of all, let me say that everybody ought to read. And those who don't know how to read, the church bears responsibility to help people learn how to read. This is, if I could say one thing to the church today, I would say, if you have uh, folks who are coming to your church who cannot read, you bear responsibility to help them learn how to read. We know this, we talk about this all the time. If you don't know how to read by the time you're out of third grade, you're going to have a hard time in life. And so I would say to, to the church, to pastors, Uh, Make sure that people can read. The second thing I would say to the church uh, generally about this is that we need to introduce people to and engage ideas that are antithetic or against what we believe. 
And we do this because of what Scripture teaches. We need to test the spirits, John says, and our responsibility is a compare and contrast. We set up the Christian message, here's what Jesus says, and then we set up everybody else's message. And we look at the two, and we see some similarities, but we see some major differences. So the big issue, I think, for us as Christians is we got to stop being so scared and afraid of things that maybe we don't know about and go read about those things we don't know about, keeping in mind, of course, the anchor of what truth is. Uh, that is, we encourage each other with sound doctrine, Titus 1.9 tells us. And we, we are bound to that, but nonetheless, at the same time, it will open up a generosity and a graciousness and a humility and a love for other people that we might not have otherwise. I think literature really does that you know, well, for somebody I, like me. If I can add to that and say that if you how you read the scriptures again will influence how you live out your faith and so if you're uh, if you're afraid of exploring the humanity of certain characters in the bible or the mistakes that somebody made or, or you know if 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 you're if you're not if you're reading it simply as a um I don't know how to say this in a entertaining way. read. Well, if you're if you're reading it just as like God's revelation to us, and it's like a it's it's only illuminating uh, God's ultimate plan. I, I don't know how to say that in a better way. If you only read it that way, then you're missing out on the the truth, which is how diff, how individual people responded to the story to the to the to the reality of God along the way and that's where we find our own place in the story and so and that's how going back to mythology that's how we understand ourselves and that's how we end up living out our our values mm -hmm. and in our, our our faith and so um there you go. A couple more questions Mark uh what books have you been studying lately or that you know we we need to maybe check out that tell a different story than the ones we're used to? Well, let me just give you an example of this, and, and it's not a book per se, but this was actually um, a discussion that was had this last weekend uh, in the New York Times where a man by the name of Christoph interviewed another man whose name is Keller. Tim Keller is a pastor of a church in New York City. And Christoph is an agnostic at least, if not an atheist, and he says uh, in this New York Times uh, interview with Keller, he says, I deeply admire Jesus but I don't get along with the virgin, virgin birth. I don't get that resurrection and the miracles and stuff. He said, can I mix and match? And Keller comes back and he says this brilliant thing. He says, if something is truly integral to a body of thought, you can't remove it without destabilizing the whole thing. And here's the takeaway line. He says, Keller says, a religion can't be whatever we desire it to be. We can't just make it something that we think it ought to be. And that's why I keep going back to uh, when people ask me, well, do you think you just think Christian messages is, is better? I say, no, it's different. It's other than just read Jesus. And if Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, you got to go talk to Jesus, man. <laughs> Don't bring that, lay it on my doorstep, you know? So that's that's really crucial to me that, that people go back and read, read the gospel for itself. And as we continue to uh, become more enlightened and educate ourselves, um, I guess. There's a need to listen to other stories. Other than oh, the ones my, that we yes. Know. Um, and the church would have you believe that something's wrong with you if you check out and read other doctrines or other Some uh, would, ways. yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, some so, would. so what do we take on that? Yeah, well, I think it really comes back to, you know, are you strong enough, stable enough in your own faith system? That is, in your own worldview, uh, understanding the truth of the gospel of Jesus. And then, see, the thing isn't about you know, being corrupted or something, it's loving people. So if you actually love other people, you're going to listen to what they have to say. You're not going to say, well, you know, they're, they've shifted my thinking or they've changed how I think about things. You're going to say, wow, you know, let me, let me think about what you've just said and uh, let's interact with some of those kinds of concepts uh, without losing your own belief system. Uh, that's really crucial. Yeah, I agree. And I guess as we close this, yeah. I just kind of came in and took over your show today. No, you're good, man. That's good. Uh, why is the heresity 
uh, of the incarnation important for the Christian story or the Christmas story? Dave, we're going to start with you as we end this program down today. Why is it important that it's historical? Uh, yeah, and, and why is it important for the Christian lifestyle and the Christmas story? Uh, well, I think going back to what I said um, earlier that it's not just a story because if it's so if it's just a story then its uh its significance is is uh diminished a little bit it's it's just another story so if it's historical if there really was a person named Jesus who was born and who was raised by you know his parents and lived a, a, a normal life and, and chose to accept, you know, his call to be uh, the savior of the world. I mean, then if it's, his, if it's true historically, then it provides the baseline, like Marcus said, for our, our actions. If it's not true, then we can decide, well, I'll take it like Mark was just saying, we can take a little bit of this and a little bit of that um, and base our lives on it. But if it is true historically, then I think it it becomes the the foil to all of the uh, other attempts at salvation that we see in our oh in our society. Yeah, big time. Yeah, the the issue of how we approach how we are saved, how we are redeemed, how do we deal with our own brokenness and and sinfulness and the wrongs that we do? How do we have any answers for those kinds of things? You know, that's really the bottom line issue. And HB, you know, I'm so thankful today for you for, uh, you know, moving in the direction you did, getting all excited about these things with us. I'm so grateful for that. Thanks, man, for for being here with us, and, uh, you know, take us away. Always my brother, man, and um, each and every Wednesday morning, you can check out some great dialogue and information from the Comenius Institute, Warp and Wolf Radio, Dr. Mark Eklund, Hell H.B. Bell, uh, Dave Pappas. This has been enlightening, brother. And, Thank you. You know, let's keep uh, working with these young people the way we are. Uh, uh, their minds have to be expanded a little more as we move forward um, instead of this caged-up bottle thinking because yeah. you can still share and believe in something without being caged up and bottled in so next week we are looking forward to talking about the state of the church in indianapolis we're going to bring a few uh pastors up in here next week and we'll be talking about some of those things but this is actually the uh the year of the reformation we're celebrating the great reformation uh that took place in the 17th century uh, 16th century and so we'll be talking about some of those things. But how is the church making a difference in the, in the state of Indiana, specifically in the city of Indianapolis? You've been listening to RadioNext.tv at the Cool Groove site. This is Warp and Woof Radio, 10 to noon every Wednesday. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. God is not absent on my campus. This is how one Comenius Institute student sees our work at IUPUI. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Echo. Multiple studies show that 75% of Christian young people may leave the church altogether after attending public universities. One of the key ingredients to maintaining Christian faith commitment through college is personal, spiritual investment in students. We are committed to spending time with Christian young people. The Comenius Institute, where Christian wisdom and college life meet.